Good morning, everyone, and thank you for starting your week with us. Uh, I'm Shane Tews at the American Enterprise Institute, and we are joined today by FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. Brendan Carr is the senior Republican on the Federal Communications Commission, and he's been described by Axios as the FCC's 5G crusader. <laughs> Carr has led the FCC's work in modernizing its infrastructure rules and accelerating the build out of high speed networks, which we're all very thankful for, even me as I am in a actually remote location today in Colorado enjoying Wi Fi. So uh, the championship, he's, uh, he's championed many regulatory reforms that, at his time at the FCC, and he's helped cut billions of dollars in red tape and enabled private sector to construct high-speed networks in communities across the country, as I know that we're continuing to do, and has been so important during COVID and the ability to work, play, and be entertained remotely. Carr is also focused on expanding America's skilled workforce. The tower climber and construction crews needed to build next generation networks and they're leading a lot of what's enabled our ability to do telehealth remotely during this crisis. So his initiatives at the FCC have been designed to drive down healthcare costs while improving outcomes for not only veterans and low income Americans, but many Americans who realize the importance of, of telehealth today. Commissioner Carr was previously served as as the general counsel at the FCC, and prior to that, he has worked on spectrum policy and competition matters as a staffer for a number of FCC offices. And before joining the agency, he was at Wiley Rhine litigating cases involving the First Amendment and the Communications Act. So, Commissioner Carr, we're really happy to have you back today. So, how? Please get us started on how 2021's getting kicked off in in uh, at the commission. Well, thank you so much, Shane, for the kind introduction, and thank you, of course, to. AEI for giving me the opportunity to discuss America's leadership in 5G. Uh, there are a lot of signs that we may soon be doing these types of events again in person. Uh, and I certainly would welcome that because when I'm speaking <laughs> at length into a blank screen, as I'm doing here today, I often wonder whether people are zoning out or perhaps even sleeping uh, in the virtual audience. Now, I don't have to worry about that when I give speeches in person. I just have to look up from the podium, and then I know for sure that people are zoning out and sleeping in the audience. In all seriousness, though, I appreciate the chance to speak here today and offer my take on a 5G agenda that will extend U.S. leadership, uh, particularly that we're on the first day now of uh, switching the clocks and losing an hour of sleep. Uh, I hope folks can, uh, can stay with us through this. I spent a lot of time uh, on the commission working to advance U.S. leadership in 5G. And I think our decisions at the FCC have made a real difference in advancing that goal. Indeed, I think securing U.S. leadership in 5G is one of the great success stories of the past four years. Now, looking back from where we stand today in 2021, this may seem like a foregone conclusion. Of course, America would lead the way. Yet our success was far from guaranteed. Just a few short years ago, we were at serious risk of ceding U.S. leadership in 5G to our overseas competitors. We were in jeopardy of losing the good paying jobs and the trillions of dollars in economic growth that come with a first mover advantage. Back then, the experts and analysts were not painting a rosy picture of America's 5G future, to put it mildly. A few years ago, Deloitte wrote that, quote, the disparity between the speed at which China and the U.S. can add network infrastructure and capacity bodes well for China's prospects in the race to 5G. They added that, quote, China and other countries may be creating a 5G tsunami, making it near impossible for America to catch up. Ernst & Young put it a bit more bluntly back then, quote, China is already in a leading role in the development of 5G and is poised to win the race to 5G. The facts on the ground certainly supported those dire predictions. On the infrastructure side, it took too long and cost too much for US providers to build the hundreds of thousands of new cell sites needed for 5G. Between 2012 and 2016, for instance, the construction of new cell sites in this country had essentially flatlined. We were averaging fewer than three new sites a day over that period. In comparison, China had started putting up 460 sites per day. So what it was taking us four years to do 
China was doing every nine days. On top of that, the excessively high permitting costs in the U.S. meant that our carriers were spending nearly three times as much as their counterparts in other parts of the world to generate equivalent network capacity. On the spectrum side, things weren't much better. The U.S. ranked well behind China, the U.K., South Korea, Japan, Germany, and others in spectrum availability. We had zero mid-band spectrum for 5G at a point in time when other countries had 300 megahertz or more. On top of all that good news, the U.S. had a grand total of zero commercial 5G offerings. This was the state of play just a few short years ago. So at the FCC, we went to work and put in place a plan to turn things around. Some people argued that we needed to be like China to beat China. They said we needed to nationalize the wireless networks or heavily regulate our way forward. Instead, we bet on America's free enterprise system and we went with a tried and true playbook, freeing up more spectrum and modernizing our infrastructure rules. On the spectrum side, we knew that 5G would be delivered over every spectrum band. So we pursued an all of the above strategy. On high band, we launched the world's first 5G spectrum auction in 2018 and went on to hold several more, bringing thousands of megahertz of spectrum to market. On low band, we completed the transition work needed to free up 600 megahertz, in addition to modifying the rules for 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz bands to enable more high speed builds. The reality is that the US started pushing this low band spectrum out more than a decade ago. On mid band though, the US had very clearly fallen behind. And in 2017, when leadership changed at the FCC, the agency had no mid band spectrum in the pipeline. So we put in the legwork to correct this mistake and that effort paid off. We held the first auction of mid-band spectrum in 2020 with 70 megahertz worth of spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz band. At 2.5 gigahertz, we transformed the rules governing nearly 200 megahertz worth of this mid-band spectrum to support 5G and teed up over 100 megahertz for auction. At 4.9 gigahertz, we modernized the regulation of a 50 megahertz swath, swath of spectrum in the L band. We auctioned 30 megahertz, we authorized 30 megahertz of spectrum for 5G and IoT. At 5.9 gigahertz, we opened up 45 megahertz for unlicensed, plus we pushed out an additional 1200 megahertz of unlicensed in the six gigahertz band. And of course, there's the big kahuna C band where we cleared 280 megahertz of this sought after mid band spectrum. All told, our spectrum efforts over the past four years opened up more than six gigahertz of spectrum for licensed 5G services, in addition to thousands of megahertz of unlicensed spectrum. These were not all walks in the park. In many cases, there were, these were spectrum bands that prior FCCs took a pass on. Not because the bands were unsuited for next-gen wireless services, but because moving forward meant taking political heat for doing the right thing. Thankfully, the FCC led by Chairman Pai took these fights head on and freed up the spectrum needed to power America's 5G. In fact, we would still be hundreds of megahertz behind, stuck in neutral while our global counterparts passed us by if we'd heeded the calls for inaction by some in Washington and on the commission. So we need to be clear-eyed about our spectrum policy going forward. Whether we like it or not, freeing up more spectrum requires FCC leadership that accumulates political capital and has the willingness to spend it. And this is the reality of spectrum policy these days, and the FCC must show strong leadership to free up more airwaves. And this brings me to the second part of the 5G playbook, infrastructure. Four years ago, it was clear that the FCC's infrastructure rules needed an update. When Chairman Pai tapped me to lead the FCC's infrastructure reforms, we moved quickly to modernize the agency's approach and cut billions of dollars worth of red tape. 
We updated the environmental and historic preservation rules that needlessly drove up costs and slowed down the timeline for adding small cells. We put in place guardrails to address outlier fees and delays imposed at the state and local level. We streamlined the process for swapping out utility poles to add wireless equipment. We created an expedited approval process for tower builds during COVID-19. We accelerated next-gen networks through a 5G upgrade order that clarified section 6409. And we paved the way for more resilient and capable cell sites by streamlining the local approval process for modifying sites that already exist. Like our spectrum decisions, these actions generated their fair share of pushback, even at the FCC. In fact, nearly every one of our infrastructure decisions included calls from some of my colleagues for the agency to slow down or to stop entirely. I'm glad we didn't because the FCC's reforms delivered results. They allowed our private sector to bring thousands of families across the digital divide to keep Americans connected during the pandemic and to outperform those dire predictions from 2016. Now I know you wanna see the data to back up these claims. Well, get ready, cause I'm about to hit you with a lot of it. Uh, if you're one of those podcast speed listeners, this might be the time that you really wished this speech had one of those two X speed buttons on the audio. So here it is. Infrastructure builds accelerated at a record pace over the last four years. In 2016, U.S. providers built just 708 new cell sites. In 2019, with our streamlined framework in place, they built over 46,000. That's a 65-fold increase. And in the written version, you'll see that that sentence has an exclamation point at the end, 65-fold increase. Telecom crews also set records for new high-speed fiber builds adding over 450,000 route miles in 2019 alone, which represents a nearly 70% increase over 2016. Those new builds are paying off for the American consumer. Internet speeds in the US have more than tripled over the last four years, far outpacing the increases seen in other countries. Indeed, the US leapfrogged ahead of 20 countries on the global mobile speed rankings over that same period of time. Competition has increased too, with the percentage of Americans with more than two options for high-speed service jumping by 52% between 2016 and 2018 alone. Prices are down and digital divide has been cut nearly in half since 2016. On top of this, we flipped the script on 5G. Americans should be proud that we now have the world's leading 5G platform. The very first commercial 5G service in the world launched here in the US in 2018. By the end of that year, the, five, the private sector had extended 5G to 14 communities. Halfway through 2019, that figure expanded to more than 30. Today, 5G networks cover over 270 million Americans. And not just in places like Manhattan or San Francisco, but in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in Peachtree Corners, Georgia, and at least one provider has committed to extending 5G to 99% of the US population, well ahead of experts' predictions. I'm proud of the results our 5G reforms helped deliver, and now is the time to build on these successes, to move 5G forward. So here's a roadmap for doing just that. And for those that have been patiently waiting for something new in these remarks, uh, now would be the time to perk up or wake up as the case may be. First up is Spectrum. With all the work we've been doing over the past four years, we now have a lot of Spectrum in the pipeline. The key is to make sure we get those airwaves out into the commercial marketplace as quickly as possible. So I'm offering up a Spectrum calendar to make sure we stay on track. I even filled it in. So here's what I propose. In 2021, we should take all of the following actions. 3.45 gigahertz, hold auction 110 for the 100 megahertz of spectrum in the 3.45 gigahertz band as required by Congress at power levels that will support 5G builds. 
The good news is that we should be voting later this week on an order that would do just that. So I am almost ready to even give us a check mark on this one. We'll see. 2.5 gigahertz. Hold an auction this year for 100, hold auction 108 this year for the 100 megahertz of spectrum in the 2.5 gigahertz band. Now this is prime mid-band spectrum that needs to get to market ASAP. We've already put the legwork in to get this across the finish line later this year by releasing a comment PN in January. Six gigahertz. We should adopt an order this year that permits very low power devices to operate in the six gigahertz band at 14 dBm. I've talked about this as a key step to promoting 5G in this country because it would help power the AR, VR, and other applications that I think are gonna drive consumer demand for 5G and for 5G devices. We have a pending further notice that would allow us to go right to an order on this and doing so would align the US with the approach taken uh, internationally, including in Brazil. In six gigahertz, we should also allow client to client devices to communicate with each other in this band. Uh, this is an issue that we saw comment on in a January 2021 public notice. It would increase efficiency and enable even more innovative use of this spectrum. <clears throat> 3.5 gigahertz. We should seek comment this year on increasing power levels for CBRS operations in the 3.5 gigahertz band. Updating the power levels here would help align the US band plan with international standards and create efficiencies for mid-band 5G builds in the US that could span from 3.45 gigahertz to C-band spectrum ranges. We should take the real world experience that we're gaining right now with CBRS builds and coordinate with federal users as we look at increasing power levels here. And getting this done will help extend the reach of 5G services to even more Americans. Next up, <clears throat> Uni 2C, 5470 to 5725 megahertz. So stay with me on this. I know this may sound like it comes out of left field, even for a lot of the spectrum geeks out there. We should start a proceeding to look at updating the rules that apply to the Uni 2C band. This band contains a large 255 megahertz wide swath of unlicensed spectrum that is vastly underutilized today. Indeed, equipment manufacturers don't even bother including this band in many five gigahertz Wi-Fi devices. This is because we have costly and cumbersome technical restraints on the band that are designed to protect federal incumbents. We should examine whether advances in technology would allow us to continue to protect those federal users, but do so with a mechanism that's a lot more efficient than the status quo that could create more opportunities for unlicensed use of this band and hopefully actually get it into consumer devices. Finally, we should work this year with Congress to ensure that it reauthorizes the FCC's spectrum authority, which expires, spectrum auction authority, which expires for most bands at the end of fiscal year 2022. We can and should get all of that done in 2021, and doing so would match the pace we've been moving on spectrum at the FCC over the last couple of years. Then in 2022, here's what should be at the top of our list. 1300 to 1350 megahertz. We should hold an auction in 2022 for the 50 megahertz of spectrum between 1300 megahertz and 1350. This spectrum was first identified as a target for clearing all the way back in 2015. And just last year, the FCC began working with NTIA on a plan that would enable the current federal incumbents to vacate the band for auction as soon as next year. Millimeter wave. In 22, we should hold another auction of millimeter wave spectrum. And the 42 gigahertz band looks to be one of the prime candidates for action next year. After 2022, there will be more spectrum bands that we can get across the finish line. First up there is lower three gigahertz. The FCC has been working with federal stakeholders to create additional opportunities for commercial providers below the 3.45 gigahertz band. The FCC has already relocated most of the secondary non-federal users out of the band to facilitate this move. And momentum is building towards making more 5G available in this band sooner 
rather than later, thanks to lessons learned during the AMBIT initiative that we worked on in the last couple of years. There are challenges that remain given the presence of some high power systems in that band, but we're well positioned to work through those issues this year and move forward with an auction of lower three gigahertz spectrum after 2022. Next up, 4.8 gigahertz. We should auction spectrum in this 4.8 gigahertz band after 2022. This is a particularly important band from an international perspective because a number of countries have moved ahead of us by licensing this spectrum exclusively for 5G. While there are many federal point-to-point -point systems in the band, we have time to open this band up for 5G in the next couple of years. Next up, 7.25 to 8.4 gigahertz. Following a 2018 directive, federal agencies have been collecting information about their operations in this band with a report due back to NTIA. With some additional legwork this year and next, we will be well positioned to reallocate portions of this band for commercial 5G operations. So the good news is we have plenty of spectrum in the pipeline. It's on us at the FCC to make sure we stick to this schedule and get this spectrum to market. Of course, we will need to pair those airwaves with more action on the infrastructure front. So here are my thoughts on an agenda that will extend the significant infrastructure gains we made over the last four years and will match the speed with which we've been moving. First, we need to get our broadband maps done this fall, not next year. Congress provided the FCC with $98 million to create more accurate and granular maps. Getting those maps done is the key to unlocking the funding that will be needed to close the digital divide. Indeed, we can't start RDOF phase two or the 5G fund for rural America, FCC initiatives that will extend high-speed infrastructure to unserved households until we get those new maps completed. If we need to allocate more agency resources to this effort, then we should do it. Speed matters. So here's one idea. Let's build off of the tech playbook and iterate. Rather than building maps that have all the bells and whistles that various groups might want, let's start with a targeted or 1.0 map. These targeted maps should focus narrowly on the data we need to move forward with the RDOF phase two and the 5G fund auction. We can then add to these maps over time. With targeted maps out by the end of the year, the FCC can then proceed with the 5G fund. And I think we should begin that auction in early 2022. Doing so will ensure that rural America gets the full benefits of 5G. And as 5G continues to extend across remote communities, we need to make it easier to build infrastructure on federal lands. Getting approval from federal agencies has long been an impediment to reaching rural communities. In fact, we often hold state and local governments to tighter timelines than the federal government itself. Now that needs to end. So here's one thing we can do. We should designate a team within the FCC, a federal lands desk, if you will, that will act as a lead coordinator with other agencies on these issues. Having a single point of contact for addressing permitting delays that still plague builds across federal lands could help break at least some of the log jams and make a difference for rural communities. We also need to keep pace with our meat and potatoes infrastructure reforms. For instance, let's make sure that the FCC's cost sharing rules for poll attachments aren't inhibiting internet builds, particularly in unserved areas. We've had a petition in front of us on this, this poll replacement issue since July, 2020. And I have it on pretty good authority that it wouldn't take much additional work or new drafting to circulate a notice of proposed rulemaking that would get this reform going. To complete America's 5G builds, we also need to nearly double the number of tower techs and telecom crews working in this country. Uh, doing so will not just accelerate internet builds, it will also create thousands of good paying jobs. I've been working and engaging directly with a number of trade schools on this effort. And we've already seen tower tech training programs launch in South Carolina, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. Earlier this month, I was in Mississippi to work on standing up another tower training program there. So as we move forward at the federal level, 
whether through legislative efforts like the Bipartisan Telecom Skilled Workforce Act, we should do so mindful of opportunities to expand the 5G workforce. Finally, I think we can all agree I need to wrap this up soon. We need to firmly reject the chewed over ideas of the past that would only turn back the clock on the progress we've made over the past four years. Regulations that would reduce private sector investment in infrastructure and prevent families from getting the best, most affordable internet services should be a non-starter. That means we must resist the odd yet emerging calls for the government to subsidize overbuilding. This wasteful and unnecessary spending jeopardizes the operations of businesses that risk their capital to serve local communities. Indeed, existing providers will be less likely to invest in new networks and upgrade existing networks if they're faced with the possibility of a government subsidized new entrant. We should also see the push for a return to Title II net neutrality for what it is, a push for rate regulation. Those backing this misguided policy simply refuse to accept the reality that the internet has flourished since we repealed the ill-advised Title II regulations. Speeds and investment are up, prices are down, competition has increased, and the resiliency of our networks are unmatched throughout the world. Indeed, COVID-19 was the ultimate stress test for global telecom policy. With the pandemic, every aspect of our lives shifted online in an instant. Throughout all of this, America's networks fared exceptionally well. Our advanced networks delivered high quality service despite elevated traffic levels. While our friends in other uh, advanced economies weren't so fortunate, their networks burdened by all the incentives and disincentives created by heavy handed regulations strained to maintain quality and speed. In Europe, EU officials asked Netflix and other streaming platforms to significantly reduce their video quality to prevent the continent's networks from breaking. Australia made a similar request, yet our networks showed no significant reduction in speed or increase in latency. In fact, US wireless networks saw speed increases despite significant jump in data usage. By contrast, China saw up to 40% reductions in download speeds and countries all across Europe and Asia experienced significant declines. In the end, our light touch approach prevailed. There is simply no justification for taking the US telecom policy backwards to a point in time where our global leadership looked to be in retreat. We need to keep moving forward. The 5G agenda I've laid out today would allow us to do just that. So thank you again to Shane and to AEI for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to the chance to take some of your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Commissioner Carr. Wow, anybody who got up today really got all their homework done on Monday. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Main thing is the asset reallocation. I think that you guys have done such a fabulous job and took on a lot of uh, difficult uh, things that people weren't willing to do earlier in, in previous FCCs. And I hope that you're planning on continuing. It sounds that way. So um, let's actually start with broadband mapping because you brought that up and it's it's confusing to somebody who's is somewhat of you know an outlier does a, does a lot of technical things you think that this is something that we'd have one metric and we'd have a complete understanding on where we're headed on this but it seems between the multiple uh programs that congress uh you know t tethers you guys with which is great because it comes along with funding uh, as well as the things that are going on over at the department of agriculture and i know ntia has been asked to put the, kind of an asset map together but when every time i go to look for this to be like i happen to be in colorado like we, you, know, where, you know where are the assets here who's getting funding where if i'm going to do something there doesn't seem to be one actual consensus document that i can go to are you guys building that the fcc or what's going on you know, there's been efforts over the years sort of fits and starts to try to uh, consolidate the approach to i think what you're talking about there, sort of attaching or using existing uh, assets, whether it's federal buildings or federal lands, uh, to try to build out broadband. They've tried to go to sort of a, I think the initiative at NTIA last year was, was sort of a one government, one permitting process approach. Um, we've never really been able to get that across the finish line. 
there's a couple other issues here. Obviously, federal lands is one that's a little bit separate. Uh, I talked there about standing up a federal lands desk at the FCC. The reality is, is there's not a ton that we have authority to do with respect to federal lands. Um, we've used the bully pulpit. We've worked with our counterparts. But I think this federal lands desk idea would at least give people on the outside, you know, a one-stop shop uh, to bring their issues. And then we can sort of coordinate out of there. And then the third piece that's sort of related to your question is just um, the broadband maps in general. And as I mentioned, the key there is until we get those maps done, we're a bit stalled on moving forward with RDOF phase two, which is going to be a very important auction for closing the digital divide, plus the 5G fund. So I think the key there is that we need to get our broadband maps done this fall, uh, not next year. And Congress provided us a lot of funding. I believe it was 98 million uh, to get that job done. So what I think we need to do is focus very narrowly on targeted maps, 1.0 maps, that would be keyed to just what we need to get uh, RDOF 2 and 5G fund going. And then if we want to add to those maps over time, we should. You know, if we want to sort of really get reticulated in terms of, uh, you know, different categories of speeds, any other type of information that is going to be important to have in the long run, we should put that on a separate track and just very focused narrowly on these targeted maps to get the 5G fund going. I think that's something um, that we certainly can get done and that we frankly need to get done this fall. Yeah, there seems to be conflation between actual access, you know, who's, who doesn't do not, do not have access and then who, who actually decides to do adoption. So there seems to be that, that confusion of, you know, is, is it available and are we still working on adoption rates or do we just, you're actually in areas that don't have the ability to get on at the speeds that people are wondering. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to those maps and the sooner the better. Um, going back to your, your spectrum auction, do you feel like the results of the C-band auction have given us enough 5G spectrum? You've, you've given us a whole swath of things that you guys are kind of restructuring there, but uh, do you anticipate the FCC will need to free up more uh, 5G for mobile spectrum coming forward? And, and it sounds like you've got a whole year long plan or, or then with it, all these different places, you're going to do some asset relocation on the ex, actual spectrum mapping and use. Yeah, C-band was great. You know, C-band yeah. was necessary, but not sufficient. Again, the the sort of dearth of mid-band spectrum that we had at the uh, in this country just a couple of years ago wasn't acceptable. And it, it took a lot of work, uh, obviously, to get C-band across the finish line. And that's why I think we need to take all of the successes we've had over the last couple of years and we need to move forward. So that's why I think obviously 3.45 is so important. Hopefully we're uh, in a good shape to, to get that done this year. I've also called obviously in this speech to hold an auction of 2.5 this year. We took the steps last year to help enable that. And I think, again, there's steps we can do in six, 3.5 gigahertz and beyond. So we're in a lot better shape than we are, uh, than we were a couple of years ago, uh, but we certainly don't have enough mid-band spectrum just yet. And so there's a lot more work we can do. And again, the good news is, so much of that legwork was done. This spectrum is in the cupboard. There's work that remains, uh, but the key now is to just get this spectrum out. And that's why I think putting out a spectrum calendar that says, all right, here's the particular bands, here's the order that you know we can move forward in them, and then we can provide some some certainty to the public, and then internally we can work towards those goals as well. You've mentioned before that you'd like to see a win-win in the 12 gigahertz. What do you think that looks like? Well, we're sure looking at the record there. I mean, the, the challenge there is is uh, is a technical one. And if we can get you know, 5G terrestrial use in 12 and continue to get the public interest benefits that come from these new generation of low earth orbit satellites, then that's great. I think we all want a win-win. And that's what the engineering at this moment uh, is, is sorting through. I'm excited about a lot of what we're seeing from this new generation of low earth orbit satellites. I think it could be a real key part of the solution to closing the digital divide, particularly when you look at the most you know, expensive hardest to serve, you know, one, two percent of the country. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that we continue to have that technology as a viable solution to close the digital divide. I'm, you know, uh, not putting all my eggs in that basket, but I'm, I'm hopeful to see what happens. So point one is we got to let the record play out, um, let the engineering play out, see if we can get to a win-win from everybody. Um, overarching that, though, is, you know, we need to make sure that um, these new uh, satellite technologies um, have a fair shot at playing what could be a significant role uh, in closing the digital divide. 
So you see that they're, you're heading towards a balance, you think, of an emerging satellite broadband with the massive demand for mid-band uh, spectrum. It's, it's been interesting. Obviously, the engineering is very important uh, because we want to make sure that it's, it, everybody's got their fair share there. But there's also been the challenge of first mover advantage, I think. Um, we, I've seen a lot of people post on Facebook this last couple of weeks that are all up on uh, SpaceX and ex excited about it because they're, they're linked in areas before. But we have also other entrants in the, in the space. So how uh, is that? That's up for, I know, the, the 12 gigahertz is up for NPRM, but are, are, this, are the space guys playing well together? I used to tease people about being space people, but now it's important. <laughs> I'm excited about it. I mean, we've, we've gone through a couple of different, you know, generations. I mean, maybe we're in the third or fourth generation of satellite. I think a lot of people early on felt like some of the, uh, you know, earliest, earliest satellite builds. I mean, it was a whole lot better than nothing, um, but the speeds obviously aren't where they are today because we're talking about networks that were planned and built, you know, decades ago. So I think this new generation of satellite, um, obviously can provide much faster speeds, much lower latency. I think that's a good thing. I and mean, when I think about sort of 5G in general, not as a, you know, a technical NR standard, but just, you know, as, a, as an umbrella term for, for next gen high speed connectivity, you know, we're seeing some really great benefits with fixed wireless, terrestrial fixed wireless, obviously, you know, mobile speeds, satellite. I think all of these technologies coming and converging together for my part, I would throw out there broadcast internet as well, because I think that's sort of a, you know, the 5G piece for broadcasters where they can participate in this converged market. I think it's great. And I want opportunities for all of those technologies to play together. Uh, and in 12 in particular, it's, it's going to come down to some, you know, engineering work that is, you know, uh, to be played out in the record. You also mentioned six gigahertz. I know that's a big uh, swath for IoT applications. And as I'm sitting yeah. here, I have six devices by me right here. So the, um, I know the six gigahertz proceedings allow companies to move forward with very low power devices. And there have been some engineering questions around that as well. Is that something that you think will get smoothed out this year? Yeah, I, I hope we can move forward this year. That's what I, what I put out there. We had a lot of really good wins in six gigahertz the last couple of years. Obviously, um, you know, the big headline one was opening up uh, the 1200 megahertz there. Uh, we left one piece there that needed uh, a bit more record development. And frankly, I think we're there at this point from my perspective. Um, authorizing VLP in doing so at 14 dBm, uh, it sounds technical and it's sort of you know hard to describe in a non-nerdy way. But the way I picture it for people is, I, I think AR VR is going to be an important vertical for 5G adoption. And I've talked about this before, but basically, like you know, if you want those you know really cool uh, AR VR glasses and things that aren't you know big and clunky like it is today. Uh, getting VLP going in six gigahertz is going to be that key connection to that, um, you know, AR VR glasses where you're not going to need, you know, a tail uh, coming off of it and limiting you. And there's so many cool things that can happen in the AR VR space. I talked before about, you know, even stuff as basic as like grocery shopping, uh, which, you know, in the pandemic has taken on a whole other sort of challenge for a lot of people. But you can put these AR VR goggles on glasses really at this at this point where I'm talking about. And you can be sort of transported to your own grocery store. You can sort of be walking down the aisle, you can actually pick stuff up uh, with haptics and feel a piece of fruit, throw it in your basket. There's all kinds of interesting opportunities that can come with AR, VR. And I think solving this VLP piece is part of unlocking it. And that's going to drive demand for new 5G devices, um, which will benefit the whole ecosystem. So I'm really excited about it. I think the work we've done over the last year, seeking further comment on this, um, you know, allows us to move forward this year. And I think that would be a really good win. I hope there's more entertaining things to do than go grocery shopping, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start to get everybody used to it. Uh, so moving over to jobs, you mentioned you were just recently in Mississippi, and I understand that their community college down there is working on a, a program that trains tower technicians. So tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I'm excited about this. I mean, there's the 5G jobs aspect is so interesting to me. And obviously, one, we need more telecom crews to complete 5G builds. I've spent a lot of time outside of DC in this job. I've, I've spent a lot of time with not just tower techs, but with, you know, the women and men that are, you know, uh, pulling fiber, uh, splicing fiber. And to a person, they tell me that they want to double the crews that they have. They're having to turn down work uh, because they don't have enough trained uh, sort of telecom techs. There's a lot of different ways into this. Uh, you can go through, there's sort of third party companies that will train people up. There's companies that are training in-house. Uh, Ericsson, for instance, um, had a facility that I visited in Louisville, Texas, where they're training their own uh, tower climbers. 
I focused on the community colleges as one piece of getting more people into this field because you can go in with you know eight to 12 weeks with basically no skills. And the key with community colleges is then it's then open to different um, scholarship opportunities, um, you know, funding that you get from military service. Uh, so you can leverage some of those opportunities to pay for it. And then after eight to 12 weeks, you are basically immediately making, you know, 50 to 60,000, again, with just eight weeks training. And Tower Techs very quickly can make six figures. And a lot of these people go on to then start their own businesses as well. So it's not just, you know, a, a job for the moment. It really is a career. So I think we need to do more to help support that. Some of it can be at the Department of Labor in terms of their tie wrap and apprenticeship programs. Um, but I think as we sort of look at this, we need to sort of keep that on the radar. And we've made progress on the community college front. Of, front. As I noted, we've stood up a number of them. Um, there's a couple more there in the works that I'm working directly with, but it's sort of just one piece of how do we create more opportunities to get into um, sort of the, the telecom tech space. So talking about equipment, how is ORAN going? I know there was a big push in the last year or two, you know, try to find a way to get around some of the, the China challenges. And part of that is to have more partners in the space and have them be able to have a, a, a net, set of network gear that is very interoperable. Um, what's the FCC's point of view on that? What's your perspective? I think we're pretty excited about the, the opportunities for ORAN. I mean, depending on which headlines you read and uh, which company's ox is getting gored, the headlines are either, you know, ORAN's going to solve everything or, uh, ORAN is a bit premature at the moment. And so, you know, we'll see how some of that plays out in the marketplace. What I'm excited about is one, it gives America's companies a chance to compete in the infrastructure space where before when you had basically, you know, expensive bespoke pieces of hardware, you needed, you know, billions and billions of dollars of R&D to get into that space and compete. But now when we sort of, um, you know, separate the hardware from the software layer, as ORAN does, uh, then you're competing on software. That's easier to compete in. Uh, a lot of U.S. companies are really good in the software space. So I think it's good in terms of leveling the, leveling the playing field for competition. I think it gives us a lot more network security as well, in part because you have a lot more options for the network year. It's going to be a more efficient build in the long run, so that should help you know drive down costs as well. So I think it's it's um, it's interesting, and it's it's interesting from my perspective. Uh, you know, to watch the, the different headlines on it play out um, because, you know, some of the incumbent equipment vendors are, you know, differently situated on, uh, on ORAN, whether it's good for them in the short, short run or long run. So I think, you know, we're doing the right thing at the FCC, which is, you know, being supportive of the trend, um, seeing if there's stuff that we can do to help accelerate it and letting the private sector figure it out from there. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those, you, it's, you, you hope it works. It seems it's like it's, it's got a lot of potential there. Um, the other thing on 5G is the interagency process. I know that there's a lot of uh, people that are interested in this at different layers. And you, you mentioned that a lot in your comments. Um, is there an interagency lead in, in this current administration that's working on 5G? Well, if you step back, you know, when the rubber meets the road, when it comes to dealing with federal incumbents, um, as I talked about in my, in my speech, whether we like it or not, that requires FCC leadership that's going to accumulate political capital and be willing to spend it. I mean, we can enter into all the MOUs you want, and we have, and we should, and we'll continue to do so. Um, and those high-level engagements are great. But as we've seen, you know, when it gets very close to actually, you know, flipping the switch and freeing up spectrum, whether we, you know, see it in the, the L-band um, you know, not necessarily federal user side, but with C-band, with other incumbents, um, with 5.9 gigahertz and DOT, um, there is a lot of reticence uh, when the rubber meets the road. And that's when I think you really got to be able to, to push through because our lens at the FCC is, you know, obviously we want every user, including federal users, to be successful, but we got to sort of make the tough calls that's going to put this spectrum to highest and best use while ensuring that our federal partners continue to carry out their missions. So, I, I think, you know, again, there's more that we can always do on coordinating and discussing, but at the end of the day, these are challenging, tough fights. If you look at the last four years, the spectrum bands that we move forward in, in many cases, whether it was 5.9 or Legato, um, those weren't sort of new ideas that came up in the last two years. These were ideas that I've joked before that, you know, every time an FC chair, you know, uh, passed the gavel, to another FCC chair, they passed both the gavel and the legato proceeding because these were always tough fights. And people said, well, 
Why was there so much, you know, headline acrimony between the FCC and federal agencies the last four years? And I'd say, because we didn't pass the buck. You know, we did the right thing, um, which was to, you know, move forward with, you know, 24, 28 gigahertz uh, spectrum, move forward with 5.9, move forward with Legato. In my mind, those are unquestionably the right calls. Could we have avoided uh, the headline disputes and said, look, we're just like every you know, other FCC. We didn't have headline level spillover in our negotiations with every agency. Yeah, we could have. You wouldn't have had the millimeter wave. You wouldn't have had 5.9. You wouldn't have had Legato. So if you really want good spectrum policy in terms of delivering results, um, you know, sometimes you're going to catch some, some, some headlines and some pushbacks. And you know, a lot of that we keep in-house. We work through the process. We work through IRAC. Um, but there's going to be a need to make some tough calls. And that is going to continue to be the case going forward. So to your point, yeah, I hope we end up in a position with, you know, the right uh, leadership to push forward on this. No, it's very important. We've seen the Department of Defense has always ongoing issues. I've always feel like they're hiding a lot of spectrum. They just don't want to share. <laughs> but, um, in the Department of Transportation, and that goes back to sort of the earlier comments you were making about uh, spectrum in, in, in just the whole idea that we need to look at it as an asset that can be reallocated as we learn more things through engineering and the ability of technology. So um, I think that we've been challenged as we've gone back and looked at, especially at the Department of Transportation, the 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 age at what the information flow, flow is. You go back and go, that's a 2012 or that's a 2005 study. So many things have come online since then. Um, and we also saw that last year with NOAA. Are we done fighting about weather with Spectrum? Or is NOAA happy now? You know, when you reallocate spectrum or, or, or push spectrum away from federal users, uh, it's never a dead issue. It's only a zombie issue. There's always <laughs> the potential for it to come back. And uh, just this week, I saw, in, I think it was in Politico, it was reported that there's a group now, you know, trying to push the Biden administration to get the FCC to unwind uh, our decision uh, in 5.9 gigahertz. And that would just be, you know, a monumental mistake. This is a spectrum that has been, you know, uh, just, you know, underutilized, to put it lightly. Uh, you know, for, for decades now, and we made the right call, um, and, you know, from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, there's no going back. And I would hope that there's, you know, a consensus at the FCC uh, with that position. But, you know, same thing with, you know, nationaliz nationalizing wireless. And we pushed back constantly on that, uh, particularly during the last administration. And it kind of, you know, was only mostly dead uh, for a lot of that time. But hopefully that's dead. Hopefully we can move on beyond 5.9 as well and not, not relitigate that one. And how are we doing on international spectrum? I know it's a year for uh, another, you know, we, whatever work, world radio, you know, there's always something yeah, going. Yeah, 23. Through. Yes, okay. So, uh, you know, we and where we try to harmonize as much as possible, which goes back to part of our, you know, what's going on with ORAN. But when we have some things on deck there, are we, we happy with our international colleagues and how things are moving forward? We expect to see success. Yeah, the teams that work on the, that work on the work processes, like they're always really talented. I'm always impressed with, you know, how much they get done. They do these around the clock negotiations uh, when we're actually in the couple weeks uh, of work. In addition to all the, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stop saying work, leg efforts, leg work uh, leading up to it. Uh, but a lot of the bands that I mentioned in this speech that I want to get done are ones that were teed up in the last work final report. And so, you know, uh, you know, having this public record of where I think the FCC needs to go that lines up with the efforts going on in work 23, I think is a good thing. You mentioned one of my least favorite phrases, which I hope we can banish soon, which is net neutrality. I am <laughs> why we still have- you know, That's actually not my least favorite, um, at least not acronym, I guess I would say. Uh, there was one at the FCC that we used to use, it was called eBARF. I think it was like Electronic Bureau Approval Request Form or something, but eBARF was always my favorite sort of, you know, inside baseball FCC term. But Net neutrality is also by good. RDOF. So, I mean, you guys need, you, you, I almost think you need, a, you need an acronym generator over there. Yep, <laughs> yep. Oh, we've got one. Yeah, we've got one. That's how we come up with this stuff. Yeah, but um, the whole, but the idea of, you know, how, where we were in 2012 and, you know, having uh, Tim Wu now in the White House and concerns about, are we dialing back and looking at, I, I just, well, part, part of it is I've never understood really the challenge that they put forward, because I don't think we've had the problems that the, you know, the net of, that it's brought forward in net neutrality. We, throttling was never an issue. Um, we've always need paid prioritization at a certain level, especially with 5G. I think we'll be able to see that with network splicing and software defined networking, that is no longer a problem. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why we're rehashing some concerns from a decade ago. Are we, do you think we're ready to move on? We're we going to go back to that battle. You know, there's a lot that has changed in the short 
time, relatively short time, uh, since we last went down or maybe first went down this misguided Title II path in, in 2015 and in 2016. Um, to your point, one difference is we're now sort of in the world of 5G and all of the really interesting use cases and applications that can come from 5G. Uh, there are certainly versions of Title II net neutrality uh, that don't seem to be consistent with, you know, very much pro-consumer competitive 5G applications. And so I do have some concern among other things, if you go back down that path, you know, you may bless an individual 5G use case or something, but you know, you could cast um, doubt over a lot of beneficial 5G use cases. So I think that's one thing that's different. I think also the dynamics politically um, and technically in terms of what's going on in the networks is very different today. You know, this idea back in 2015, 2016, when, you know, people pitched this idea that, you know, the greatest threat to a free and open internet um, is the mom and pop ISP in Iowa and therefore needs, you know, the heaviest of heavy handed regulations in the form of Title II to keep a free and open internet. I mean, flash forward to today, the choke points are in a very different position. Uh, and it's not just, you know, when you look at the edge of the, the network and the social media applications, it even uh, is starting to move down the stack. And you see, you know, infrastructure side providers, uh, whether AWS, Cloudflare, that are or have um, taken action to, you know, uh, prevent um, sort of the free flow of information. So I think the dynamics now of trying to say, you know, ISPs, which in the absence of Title II um, have not been engaging the type of conduct that people say requires Title II. And on the other hand, you've got these other infrastructure providers and edge providers that are engaging in that type of conduct. I think it's a very different um, scenario uh, to try to move forward with a you know, a heavy handed ISP only approach. So my view is what we're doing is undeniably working. You know, COVID-19 was the ultimate stress test. The progress we made with our light touch approach brought thousands of families across the digital divide before COVID hit. So they had access to the internet and those people on the internet had a far better experience than our international counterparts in terms of speeds and performance because of our approach to network regulation. We are seeing providers invest, you know, double their counterparts in Europe, for instance, um, because of our framework. So what we're doing is working and to somehow sort of turn around and say, you know, we need to, to single out ISPs for heavy handed regulation based on concerns of things that are in fact going on in other parts of either the infrastructure or the edge um, is a much more difficult argument both to make, but also to sustain, I think, on appeal in terms of an arbitrary uh, nature of an FCC decision. So I think there's things that are very different today than they were when this happened in 2015, including you know, the Supreme Court, uh, which you know, in my view would potentially look very skeptically uh, more so today than ever on this type of approach. There's also the issue of, of the, what I call the privacy donut hole. You know, Congress passed the um, CRA on the FCC's privacy rules in 2017. And so if you were to reclassify the internet under Title II, that divests the FTC of 100% of its authority over the privacy practices of ISPs. And because of the um, privacy CRA, that donut hole is unfillable. We, we, we do not have the authority to put privacy rules in place. And so I think, again, that's you know, not just a practical public policy problem. Uh, I think it's also a legal problem uh, in terms of an arbitrary uh, decision, or at least a, a decision that would have very significant APA problems uh, to say, yeah, we, you know, we eliminated uh, privacy rules uh, that apply to ISPs and yeah, we don't have a way to fill it in, but you know, so be it. I think, I think that's a tough position to be in. So I think there's a lot that's different about 2015, 2016, again, sort of the, the sky is falling predictions that we saw, you know, the opposite happened, speeds are up, competition's up, the digital divide's closing, um, plus who and where some of this conduct, uh, who, 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 who is engaging in some of this conduct and where in the network and in the edge, the privacy stuff. So, um, you know, simply, quote unquote, you know, returning to Title II regulation to the FCC uh, is quite the briar patch. It's not going to be a, a, an easy walk forward. Um, and of course, I think it'd be the wrong path forward. There's also the issue of just net neutrality rules. You know, the basic rules of the road are ones that I'm comfortable with. And um, I have no problem moving forward with, quote, net neutrality. Um, that's not Title II net neutrality um, at the FCC or otherwise. 
Uh, yeah, Joel Thayer wrote a piece this past week about the importance of looking at it as a stack. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And that also brings in, um, you know, just the idea of content, as I know there's been a lot of confusion around Section 230. There's a lot of issues that have come up since that, you know, the idea of net neutrality, but the idea that you need responsibility at every level. And then the question is, at, at, at what legal responsibility? And, and 230 is one that I know has is, is had a lot of confusion. I'm looking at a note. There was an, uh, a letter sent last week, and this just surprised me. It was from Anna Eshoo, co-signed um, House Energy and Commerce, specifically to the cable companies to be a content curator, which seemed really awkward <laughs> to me. And your uh, quote about it, they said that it, see, they wanted to acknowledge cable, satellite, and over-the-top companies disseminating media outlets of American viewers have done nothing to respond to misinformation by these outlets. I thought that was an interesting group to, to kind of call out and you noted that it had that this idea had a chilling transgression on the free speech of every media outlet in the country enjoys and that's just another app you know part of the the networking asset and, and the internet so I, I just any further thoughts on that yeah i thought that you know that the letter to the the cable and other streaming providers was a mistake my, my position is really simple i want you know more speech not less i think having the government you know on official congressional letterhead writing to uh, news outlets uh, and asking them what is the moral and ethical principles that you know guide your coverage uh, really is a, is a chilling transgression of, of free speech and not one uh, that we should that we should be going down so obviously I thought that was a, a mistake and I think it's important that all of us sort of you know stand up and, and, and speak out when we see that the challenge I see stepping back for the country really is, is more of a cultural one I mean if you look look back uh, I've talked about this before, I think, that like the very first modern day op-ed launched in 1970 on the pages of the New York Times. And the reason was because the editors um, wanted perspectives that were very different from the perspectives and the arguments that we made um, by, you know, the, the ed board or by the staff writers of the New York Times, that the idea that they said was that, you know, diversity of views is the lifeblood of democracy. That was the New York Times when they were um, you know, opening up their pages to a diversity of views. And flash forward to today, um, I think we're sort of heading in the opposite direction, uh, where diversity of views is no longer looked at as a strength, as vital to, demo to democracy. I think that's dangerous. And so we see this trend towards, you know, what I call legislating by letterhead. You know, Congress can't pass a law um, that would, you know, force a streaming provider, uh, you know, to, to, to discriminate against one of these news outlets. But they can write, you know, a pointed letter, and they can sort of help support ad boycotts. And so we have this um, effort that I would say is sort of outside of the constraints of the First Amendment. That's a thumb on the scale in favor of censorship. And this entire trend in this country towards less speech, more censorship. We're seeing it right now with, you know, Substack. You've got, you know, journalists and others that are pushing back and saying, you know, we don't want people to be able to, you know, speak and launch their own sort of news outlets through through Substack. Again, I think. We need to reorient as a country towards the idea that agree or disagree, let's get more speech out there because at the end of the day, the ideas that we embrace, whether it's one side of that debate or the other, are going to be better ideas, stronger ideas, uh, more innovative ideas if we hash all this out um, through public debate. And so I think in some ways that letter that we saw was in indicative, I think, of a broader trend of of free speech being in retreat. And it comes to every institution to stand up and say, look, I agree or I disagree, don't agree, um, but let's at least have this debate. So I think we got work to do in this country to, to get back to where we were in the 1970s, at least, with this embrace of diversity of views. Thanks, that's really helpful. Okay, so I've got a couple questions from the audience. We've got about three minutes left. This has been so informative this morning. Let's see, what steps have the FCC taken to reduce barriers to infrastructure deployment by state and local governments thus far? And are there any significant challenges that remain in this area? Yeah, we took a lot of steps in this direction. Most notably um, was a decision we issued that put some guardrails in place on the fees that state and local governments charge and timelines for action. You know, what we saw was that particularly in rural communities, um, the capital to build out next gener generation networks was flowing, you know, slowly, if at all, in part because we had, you know, million dollar fees being charged in some of the largest cities in the country, whether it was Manhattan or San Jose. So we stepped in with some guardrails there. Since that decision, uh, we have seen infrastructure builds accelerate, including in rural areas. So I think that's good news. I think there's more to do. And to the extent that we're hesitant at the FCC now, uh, to engage in those efforts. I'm happy to work directly with state legislatures as well to try to look at state and local laws and how do we uh, make them uh, uh, 
such that they create the right incentives. I was in Pennsylvania in October, I think of last year, uh, testifying in front of a, a state Senate committee on some ideas that they could use to uh, accelerate infrastructure bills by reforming state and local rules. So I think those are types of efforts that I would welcome to continue engaging. But yeah, we definitely have more work to do. Um, we did a lot, but there's more to do on the infrastructure front. Great, thank you. Second question is, can you discuss satellite broadband and its promise for closing the digital divide? Are there any policy barriers we need to overcome to make this a reality? Yeah, this I think we touched on a, a little bit earlier. You know, I'm, I'm um, hopeful that this latest generation of low earth orbit satellites is gonna make significant difference. We're seeing them launch you know, by the hundreds right now. Um, if you talk to some in Congress, I think they view this as you know, a big, big piece of the solution to the digital divide. At this point, I say it's a piece of the solution to the digital divide. I don't know how big it's gonna be, but I'm hopeful and I wanna continue to see these uh, uh, you know, launches go on and people get service. Um, so I'm excited about the potential for it. Great, thank you. All right, well, we are at uh, the half hour and I just wanna thank you again. It's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you. You have a lot on your plate this year, but it sounds like you guys are, are working on getting us connected. We're all excited to see more, more 5G coming across America. Thank you. Great, thank you.